scientists and scholars converge to explore the sacred through scientific inquiry. Welcome to the Neurospirituality Symposium. Welcome everyone to the inaugural Neurospirituality Symposium. So excited to see so many people here in person. I'll be quite frank, this is more people than I expected to be here in person on a Friday morning. Welcome also to the hundreds of people who have registered online and welcome to the thousands of people who will watch this in the future as these videos, these talks are recorded and generating evergreen content moving forward here. Um, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers. When we were organizing this, I was thinking, okay, it would be amazing if we had even a fraction of the speakers who are participating today attend, share their work, share their thoughts with us. And so the fact that we've got as many speakers as we do is wonderful. It's blowing my mind already. If you are doing neurospirituality work, spirituality science work, we want to know you. We want to be connected with you. We really want this to be a community endeavor. So as I said, my name is Michael Ferguson. Welcome again. I'm going to be speaking today on foundations of neurospirituality. Background is that I'm an instructor in neurology at Harvard Medical School, and I direct the neurospirituality lab. I also direct first-year wellness programs at Harvard College, which is a really unique opportunity to take these insights that we're developing from our laboratory research and to identify ways that they could be translationally applied for student well-being. My personal spiritual biography started when I was a baby, being rocked in a rocking chair by my mother as she sang hymns, and that really planted that spirit inside of me. I grew up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and when I was 19 years old, served a two-year full-time mission in Arizona, a Spanish-speaking mission. Got to know the beautiful hispano hablante gente in Arizona, and have had just ridiculous blessings. Um, my husband is my best friend and best adventure buddy. Um, this is our recent pilgrimage to Lourdes, France, and to be able to continue to explore the wide horizons of human spirituality and diversity is one of the greatest joys of my life. The research that I do, even if it's explicitly scientific in nature, it's always infused with some kind of background spiritual question. So for example, when I was studying intelligence during my first postdoctoral fellowship, I was greatly inspired by Joseph Smith, who was the founder of the Restoration, sometimes in Mormon movement, by one of his teachings that the glory of God is intelligence. And so, wait a second here. If you take that proposition seriously, or propositions like that seriously, and then you start looking at cognitive neuroscience and its content, its methods, its mappings, we start to have a convergence. We start to look at ways in which we could have a hylomorphic, or in other words, a form approach to spirituality that doesn't require dualism, that can be extremely compatible and even synergistic with the paradigms of current contemporary, uh, current cognitive neuroscience. I've been fortunate to have dual appointments at Harvard Divinity School and Harvard Medical School. And what that's enabled me to do is to really bring together these disparate fields into a unified approach to understanding spirituality using tools of neuroscience, but importantly, and maybe less intuitively for some people, also using tools of spirituality to understand the brain. This is a dynamic relationship. I cut my teeth doing classic task-based fMRI with one of my longtime friends and colleagues, Jared Nielsen, who you'll hear from today. We had participants go into a scanner. These were highly religiously motivated individuals, and they were reading texts that for them are sacred, that they consider scripture. In this case, it was the Book of Mormon. They had a button that they would press. So when they were feeling the spirit, when they had a, a moment of religious ecstasy or spiritual elevation, they would indicate to that, they would indicate that to us that we could timestamp it and then look at what was happening in the brain during those moments. And yes, we can talk about the neuroanatomy that's functionally involved when these individuals are feeling the spirit. But honestly, the most important take home for me is that this worked at all. We were doing something that was a 
a big risk in the sense that we were spending a lot of money on scan time. Not sure if we were going to get the effects that we were looking for. So when our first volunteer participant was in the scanner, reading the Book of Mormon and pressed the button for the first time, indicating to us that she was having a peak spiritual experience. That was our Super Bowl touchdown moment where we're like, this is going to work. <laughs> so it's really important then for us to understand that people are reliable reporters of their own spiritual experiences. These individuals in the study were quote unquote everyday lay people. These weren't monks who had been meditating and praying in seclusion for decades. Um, regular folks are reliable reporters of their own spiritual experience to the degree that we can statistically map the brain's participation in those self-reports. I go into more details about this particular study in my TEDx talk titled, This Is Your Brain on God, which I'll invite you to check out uh, if you're interested, but I want to move on to some of the more recent work that I've been doing. I mentioned that task-based fMRI is the classic paradigm people often think of when they're doing these types of studies. We're using a different strategic approach called lesion network mapping. What lesion network mapping involves is identifying patients for whom there's a focal area of brain damage. Then, identifying the functional networks that those lesions are connected to. Um, I'll go ahead and make a parenthetical note since I think this is super cool. But lesion mapping based on locations is actually an ancient technique. So Galen, the Roman physician, has notes about how he would do lesion mapping in soldiers when they were returning for war. You had a penetrating head trauma. You had some kind of a cognitive or behavioral deficit. And so Galen and others like him, the Byzantine neuroanatomists in the third and fourth century also write about this, would make inferences about localizations of function. They correctly identified where the motor strip is located. They correctly identified where higher frontal processes of reasoning are located. But one of the things that we have on the ancients is the connectome. The connectome is a wiring diagram of the human brain. What that allows us to do then is to look not just at what are the individual neuroanatomical locations that have been damaged by a brain lesion, but what is the network that those lesions are impacting. And one of the things that we're observing in symptom after symptom after symptom and behavior after behavior after behavior is that these longstanding medical mysteries of why is it that lesions in all different parts of the brain would have the same impact is now being elegantly solved as we're seeing that those lesions are all part of a common underlying network. My question then with my longstanding interest in spirituality was whether we could use some of these tools to look at perhaps the most widespread aspect of human behavior. And the answer is that yes, we can apply these methods. In fact, our first attempt to map spirituality using lesion network mapping was published in the journal Biological Psychiatry in 2021. And in this paper, we were looking for a domain general circuit that's associated with spirituality and religiosity. It, I mean, we were really going for the most general approach possible. So the self-report was, do you consider yourself a religious person? Yes or no? And we saw a significant association with whether an individual identifies as religious or not based on their circuits for the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray is a midbrain nucleus. And so this was really surprising. You know, oftentimes when we think about complex cognition and higher order functions, we're thinking about the cerebral cortex. We're thinking about the areas of the brain that have evolved most recently in terms of biological time spans. So the fact that we saw what's often considered a high level function localizing to circuitry that's associated with something very, very basic in terms of instinct behavior evolution, it was a surprise. What does the periaqueductal gray do? Well, in an independent meta-analysis looking across 16 different fMRI studies, the periaqueductal gray was observed to be involved in compassion. Also in a forthcoming case report with a rare lesion directly and exclusively on the periaqueductal gray, the patient reported that 
she no longer was able to feel love for her children. So with these three different imaging modalities and approaches in mind, we can line them up and see that spirituality, compassion, maternal love are all localizing significantly to this region of the brain. I want to be clear, though, that as we're approaching things like neurospirituality and religiosity, we're not approaching this with rose-colored glasses on. We recognize, like many world religious leaders, that religion can introduce challenges into human cognition, into human behavior, into human sociality. The Pope, in his 2015 speech to the U.S. Congress, said that no religion is immune from forms of individual delusion or ideological extremism. So with that in mind, it sets up a question of whether there's a brain network that could reliably moderate religious extremism. And this is a type of question that we can approach with lesion network mapping. The results of this study were published just recently. This was a September 2024 article in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where we demonstrate that there is a brain network that is, <laughs> quite frankly, surprisingly strongly associated with religious fundamentalism. And it was a network that was constituted by primarily right lateralized aspects of the frontal, parietal, and temporal cortices in the brain. One of the things that we have the ability to do since I'm operating at a medical school, we've got this incredible library of patient symptoms and of brain imaging, which allows us then to do comparisons of our results against our library of existing brain circuit maps. In a data-driven fashion, we observe that the strongest similarities to the fundamentalism circuit were brain signatures that have been associated with confabulation and with criminal behavior. And now confabulation, for folks who might not be familiar with it, it's a clinical condition where individuals are fluently making statements that are demonstrably untrue but they have no insight into the fact that the things that they're stating are not based in reality. Current work is looking at a wide array of spiritual and religious self-report measures, mapping each of those individually to an underlying brain circuit, and then running mathematical analyses to show how similar these individual circuits are to one another. And what we observe is two big clusters, one associated with dogmatic beliefs and one associated with mystical experiences. So dogmatic beliefs, for example, would be whenever science and sacred scripture conflict, science must be wrong. And you can see that that's on the extreme side. There's a whole, whole important conversation of disentangling dogmatism from fundamentalism, from orthodoxy. They're not all the same thing. I also want to be really clear that this is not with any type of sneer or disparaging intonation for what we mean by dogmatic, it's meant to be descriptive. On the extreme side of the mystical type experiences is endorsement of the statement that I've had an experience in which I felt nothing is ever really dead. So maybe the last thing I'll point out here is that the circuit pattern for mysticism is functionally inverted to the circuit pattern for fundamentalism. And so it suggests that, you know, if one is looking for an antidote, as it were, for religious fundamentalism, it wouldn't necessarily come from atheism so much as it would come from mysticism. Again, we did our specificity analysis to look at what circuits are most similar to the mysticism brain pattern. And very provocatively, we see that it's an inversion of confabulation. In other words, mystical experiences make you, um, with a couple of inferential steps, we would hypothesize the mystical experiences would make you less likely to make things up. And the strongest similarity far and away was with blindsight, which is fascinating for a number of reasons. One, blindsight is a condition where you know without knowing how you know. We did a specificity analysis to see whether the mysticism signature was really a product of visual sensory deprivation, or if there was something specific to the dimensions of insight knowing. And we saw that there was a stronger association with blindsight relative to cortical blindness, indicating that there may be some, some gnosis that is involved over and above the sensory deprivation that we're seeing in the signature for mysticism. So closing here, I'll just nod to some of the future work that we're doing. We're launching a series of prayer science studies 
we're going to begin with the three largest world religions, so Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, looking at contemplative prayer approaches, systematically introducing them, drawing from, from centuries and millennia-old tradition. We're not making up anything new here. We don't need to. And in fact, on March 5th, so aligning with Ash Wednesday to launch off this year's Christian Lenten season in the Western Christian tradition, we'll be doing an introduction to hesychasm. So feel free to check that out when it goes live this week. In summary, scientists interested in the brain have tended to avoid studying religion or spirituality for fear of being seen as unscientific, and that needs to change. And these are not my words. These are from Nature magazine. This is amazing that we're seeing a zeitgeist, really, of attention and permission being given to lending attention to these questions of religion and spirituality. Science takes a team, and I am so blessed to have an amazing group of collaborators. Science also takes support, and I'd be remiss to not thank Michael Fox and the Center for Brain Circuit Therapeutics, the Templeton World Cherry Foundation, the Osher Center for Integrated Medicine, and the Center of Emergence for their generous support. And of course, we welcome additional support. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in these topics. And my wish is that you may find your highest meaning and your deepest purpose. Thank you for attending the Neurospirituality Symposium. For more info and future events, visit neuromichael.com.